So hi, everyone. I'm Diana Delgado. I'm the literary director of the University of Arizona Poetry Center. And I want to welcome everyone to our uh, second episode of the Institute for Inquiry in Poetics. The Institute uh, was founded at the University of Arizona, is a thought center designed to create space and time for poets to respond to pressing questions that reside at the intersection of social concern and poetry encouraging interdisciplinary modalities and investigative research, the Institute will ask poets a series of questions and digitally archive their responses on poetry.arizona.edu. Today, I'm super excited to host Peter Harris, Michael War, Louis Vett Resto, and Luis J. Rodriguez as part of this year's theme, Beyond the Obvious. And we're especially excited to explore again how imaginative language and poetry can help create a sense of belonging. Um, in our program tonight, each poet will be reading for about 15 minutes, um, sharing work in response to our theme. And then after the reading, we'll be in conversation. Before we begin uh, tonight's uh, reading and program, the University of Arizona Poetry Center must acknowledge that we exist on the traditional homelands of the Ta'ona Odom, who have cared for these lands for centuries. As a guest in these lands, I want to acknowledge that we are an occupied Ta'ona Odom territory. Our first reader um, is Peter J. Harris, and I'm going to read a little bit about Peter before uh, they read. Peter J. Harris is a 2018 Los Angeles COLA Fellow in Literary Arts, Fellow of the Los Angeles Institute for the Humanities at USC, an award-winning poet. He is the author, author of Bless the Ashes, Poetry by Tia Tucha Press, winner of the 2015 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award, and the Black Man of Happiness in Pursuit of My Un Unalienable Right, a book of personal essays winner of a 2015 American Book Award as well. In 2021, Flower Song Press will publish Harris's Safe Arms, 20 Love and Erotic Poems with an Ooh Baby Baby Moon with Spanish translations by Francisco Letelier. Harris is also the founding editor of the Black Man of Happiness Project, a creative, intellectual, and artistic expression of Black men and joy. Harris writes the blog, Reeking Happiness, a Joyful Living Journal and can be found at www.inspirationcrib.com. I, I love that uh, landing site, by the way, Peter. Mm. His 2018 TEDx Pasadena talk with Adenike A. Harris, a Huntington Library, Healing versus Retaliation, Surviving Trauma and Sexual Abuse, described and celebrated 15 years of working with his daughter after convicting and jailing her predator ex-stepfather. Harris and his daughter are also contributors to Love with Accountability, Digging Up the Roots of Child Sexual Abuse, edited by Aisha Shadia Simmons. Since the 1970s, Harris has published his work in a wide variety of publications, including Wide Awake, Poets of Los Angeles and Beyond, edited by Suzanne Loomis, Altadena Poetry Anthologies for 2018 and 2019, and Coiled Serpent, Poets Aspiring uh, poets, excuse me, Coiled Serpent, Poets Arising from the Cultural Quakes and Ships in Los Angeles, edited by Nilan Jana Banerjee, Daniel A. Olivas, and Ruben J. Rodriguez. Since 1992, Harris has been a member of the Anan Anansi Writers Workshop at the World Stage in LA's Lemert Park. Thank you, Peter, for being here with us today. My pleasure, thank you. Don't stick your head out the window. It's shooting everything that glows. That's a personal quote from Nikki Finney. November sings in tongues through shivering trees. Winter's tambourine stirs barbecued leaves. Short day sundown cloaks ancestral saxophonists, savoring tropical memory, perfuming the promise of hawk, soloing its biting lullaby of dusk, horn section for everyday people. Nana, Tio, Auntie, cuz, 
All hear tunes they want the wind to play, to soothe ears stung by wine of bell-curved lyres, English-only cantors, Nordstrom scholars, one-note theorists. My own soundtrack echo King Curtis, blowing me a raspy escape route out the box canyon of my mediocrity. Fingering me a bridge to a safe place where Bobby Bird invites me to repeat after him, I know you got soul. If you didn't, you wouldn't be in here. Sitting in on the jam session of resistance, searching my instrument for one grace note pure enough to bop gun frontliners who have exhausted their funk. Horn section tuned and timed to roll with the ball bearing needs of any era, comping for the call to hit me, accenting pleas of a Vietnam vet on homeless knee, throbbing between fingers of men reciting the million man pledge, praying she'll come back to me, stretching time while she meditate strutting when she say, mm -hmm. swaying when she hold me in her storybook arms. High noon, sprawling from an orchestra on the curve of a liquid sky, filled with soloists begging for the nod to eliminate all together words, to eliminate all words together, to eliminate words all together, acts, angled like prayers or unchained like train, willing to leap into the wind or worry a toothpick as only a virtuoso signifier can do the do. From mouth on machine, activated by inspiration, vocabulary of sound, daring us to repeat when breath of turning seasons chill our intentions. I know you got soul. If you didn't, you wouldn't be in here. Oh, I know you got soul. If you didn't, you wouldn't be up in here. Inside the mind or outside the senses, there are sacred places where doors spring open from pressure of baby steps, where even squeak of hinges sound like Reverend Cleveland's all-star choir, where lives of asthma get resuscitated and we can get on with the daily business, making the streets of our world safe for men and women to double dutch in peace, slipping like sound between the bolo ties, waving and weaving at the wrist action of girls with names that swing through the alphabet. There are sacred places inside the city and outside the jails where rules heal at whisper of first notes, where even demands of commandments fit like a one-off ensemble, where lives of sclerosis get massaged and we can get on with a daily livelihood, making streets safe for men and women to play jacks in peace, counting sing song up past their tensies, bouncing little balls high enough, high enough to gather scattered lives in one smooth grab with the wrist action of boys combing hair before a lint-free weekend date. There are men and women with sacred places inside who surrender to the word without becoming vengeful missionaries and crusaders carrying spears and scimitars and automatic weapons of conversion uh -uh to the word of ruthless invisibility. Get to the word of the gesture within the common smile, the, the candy gesture, the gesture of peeled bananas, the word of the common reprieve written without commission 
from nobody's ruling class, from nobody's royal decree, inside borders or outside jurisdictions. There are sacred places with doors fitted with spiritual carpentry, with rules jigsawed of stone contemplation, where men and women are safe to live long as they supposed to and die in their own unrehearsed moment with another good idea perched on the lip of their ever ready tongue. In Nappy Edges, uh, Intazaki Shange said something like this, quite simply, a poem should fill you up with something, could make you swoon, stop in your tracks, change your mind or make it up. A poem, she says, should happen to you like cold water or a kiss, celebrating passion. Brazen as a crack pipe, selling traveling sales, who scams a taxi driver, sneaks into my house and draws a bubble bath in my clawfoot tub. Foreplay like that. Face down, entangled lotus flowers transplanted to a shallow pool in the Everglades, tongue kissing a crocodile drunk on Gatorade and thrilled he just escaped a dare to sunbathe in the bed of a Prada pickup truck idled by flat front tires. Passion like that. Relishing your wet sex chanting sea salt scented language of awe like a sommelier graduated from high school in Southeast DC. Humble shoulders curved like a Muslim bowing for the eighth prayer of the day, fending off blue wind of low riding constellations, insisting we shush this luxurious conversation spoken in the round, loving like that. When I fall back off your rippling, glistening nipple, nodding like a swooning newborn, cradle the back of my neck, Blow soft puffs of change into my mouth. Hum a bluesy, nameless lullaby until I see halos of intimacy like link Olympic rings swirling slowly above your head. Love like that, be like that. Before I faint, chant my name in your nighttime voice raspy as Bobby Womack, streaked with soprano only my touch summons, gloom all gone, like that, yeah, like that, tambourine shivering up and down our ovulating spines. I believe I'm right at the end, so let me close. Um, always got to get some love and erotic in it because right now they don't want us to touch at all and i think we got to do a lot of good work to heal the country but can never forget the erotic and the and the love we can find enemies anywhere where are the allies dedicated to chumping fear and paralysis. We can find the danger anywhere. Where are the havens draped with honeysuckle for food and wisdom? We can find gangrene anywhere. Where are the vitamins spiked with helium for circulation and vision? We can find silhouettes anywhere. Where are the citizens? Where are the citizens? The voice of bravery is a chant of lightning, freezing the mirage, freezing the mirage. Heroes are charting the quicksand, 
their footprints, their trail marks harden into muddy architecture. Will someone stride with common purpose? Who will gather to inspect the promise of Oasis? Voice to voice, claiming the mirage, claiming the mirage, honored and rejoicing. We are the company of the citizens. Yes, we are the company of the citizens. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. That was beautiful. And I especially loved um, this idea about, um, you know, they don't want us to touch, but we can respond by sort of living in and writing about the erotic. Um, and I think that's a, that's a lesson I want to think, think more into. But thank you. That was gorgeous. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up, we have Michael War. Um, and I'm going to start by reading Michael's bio with two quotes um, about their work. Um, his poetry is frank and full body. Michael has a sharp eye and a sanity that refuses to make compromises. Gwendolyn Brooks. I don't think you need to tell me that these poems are the real thing, brilliant in language and imagination, never a nerveless line. They move in both senses of their own music and of the heart, but I'm telling you anyway, Adrian Rich. San Francisco poet Michael War is the 2020 Berkeley Lifetime Achievement Awardee and poetry editor of the anthology of Poetry and Protest from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin published by W.W. W. Norton. His books of poetry include The Armageddon of Funk, which has which the Black Caucus of the American Library Association described as a poetic soundtrack to Black life. Power Lines, a decade of poetry from Chicago's Guild Complex, as a co-editor with Julie Parson Nesbitt and Luis Rodriguez, and We Are All the Black Boy, all published by Tia Chucha Press. He co-edited the bilingual chapbook Catching Memory with poet and translator Chun Yu, Catching Memory features poems and short stories in English and Chinese that evolved out of war and use two languages, one community workshop series. In 2017, he was named a San Francisco Library Laureate. Other honors include a Creative Work Fund Award for his multimedia pro project, Tracing Poetic Memory in Bayview Hunters Point, Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award for Excellence in Literature, Black Caucus of the American Library Association Award, Gwendolyn Brooks Significant Illinois Poets Award, National Endowments for the Arts Fellowship, Ragdale Foundation US Africa Fellowship, the Beat Museum Poet of the Month, and other honors. His poetry in collaboration with musicians, visual and performing artists has been dramatized on stage, depicted on canvas, and set to original music. Michael is also the former deputy director of the Museum of the African Diaspora and has extensive experience in community-based arts. He's a board member of the Friends of the San Francisco Public Library. Thank you, Michael, for being here with us today. We welcome you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to um, say happy 60th anniversary to the University of Arizona Poetry Center. I appreciate this opportunity to participate um, in this convening by the Institute for Inquiry and Poetics on the theme of Beyond the Obvious. And I hope that the dialogue that we engage in today uh, finds a way to continue. I'm going to share the three poems that I referenced in my essay, uh, Searching for Language, which is to be published on the University of Arizona Poetry Center blog. Uh, most of my poems that have a public presence are overtly political. And although I believe that everything is political, not all my poems are overtly or specifically political in nature. One of the points of my essay, Searching for Language, is to illustrate that language, at least the language of my poems, um, ultimately, flow, ultimately flow from the form, from the purpose of the poem. And not even the San Joaquin is a love poem that I wrote to my wife, Patricia Zamora, in which I tried to capture the 
emotion of loss and the sense of being lost ca caused by six months of separation before reuniting with her as we returned to live in California from Chicago after years in Chicago. And it is published in my second book of poetry from Tia Chucha Press, The Armageddon of Funk. I'm gonna share that with you now. Not even the San Joaquin to Patricia Zamora. At nature's intervals of light and darkness you are missing. I may seem unaware as other voices, words, obsessions, and untamed terms for the next comp completion clutter what I breathe. These are simply everyday secessions. You are ever flowing. Where you normally fly, circle, land, and create inside me seems empty until at least I hear your song. Mist is too mundane a word. In truth, you are never gone. You are spun into what I am made of, and so you are with me. Missed, but not missing. Your absence measured in change, a part of Chicago stolen. My motion reduced to one room, my wanderings alone, my days adrift, my balance spent. You bring the invincible joy that escapes me. Love is too mundane a word. Still, I speak it to you. Within this stuttering, unromantic uttering is my devotion. The reach of your radiance is endless. It spans continents. So we are near in this dictatorship of distance. Still, I want to be not merely near you, but with you, with no valleys between our warmth. So that was written at the end of 2007. At the end of 2019, I was invited uh, to honor the poet Bob Kaufman on the release of collected poems of Bob Kaufman by City Lights Publishers. And I thought the best way to honor him was with a poem. Uh, in that poem, I adopted language that to some extent is not my own. Um, I did not, I did this not as a plagiarist, uh, but as an explorer seeking language that fits the purpose of the, of the poem. I was born in 1955 the year that Allen Ginsberg read Howe at Sixth Gallery in North Beach and in San Francisco. And although my journey as a poet began in San Francisco, I was not directly influenced by um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti and the Beats. I was, however, um, radicalized as a teen during the Black Power, the anti-war, the American Indian, the La Raza, and the feminist movements. And I assume that those movements and the Beats indirectly influenced my poetry. Uh, Kaufman was among the poets in the anthology 3000 Years of Black Poetry, which I stole as a teenager. And I credit many of the poets in that collection for my adolescent audacity to claim myself as a poet. Um, and I allowed Kaufman's unique style to possess me as I um, wrote a praise poem to him. And I was writing in a form that was a typical for me. And I, I only knew Kaufman through the wizardry of his words, uh, which is why my poem is entitled Searching for Bob Kaufman. Hieroglyphic petals illuminate an adolescent trek through the paper fills flat plains and edited savannas of 3000 years of black poetry. The traveling trickster emerges centuries of chapters away from Africa's ancient poets, anonymous, spine to spine with those known, Wheatley, Dunbar, Brown, Hughes, Brooks, King, Jones, Evans, Giovanni, and Cruz, bound to the sticky fingers of this black boy, seeking non-mystical space between liberation and Ecclesiastes. He never knew this sometimes speaking in tongues saxophonious poet, except through sorcery etched in ether and improbable perfect juxtapositions and mind bending visions manifest in maddening unmarked stone and gravity defying language turning the underground upside down and silence deafening to those who want to listen and sonic waves of syllables soothing the soul of blue wells and explosive lines fueled by heavy water and inaudible beats drowning out fascistic love ins and inescapable jailbreaks from forced criminality and masses of massive solitude out in the open and iterations blocking 
unblocked iterations and revelatory secret acts of resistance inside the mind of a Milky Way, a black hole absorbs our light to be enlightened. So in, in that poem, I was not just searching for Kaufman, but I was also searching for, for language. And my poem, What Not To Do, an unfinished poem, um, in content and theme and emotion is the typical poem for, for, for me. And I traced my exposés of police brutality and killings to my witness encounter and intervention in an incident when I found a police officer nervously shaking a 357 Magnum in the face of an unarmed black boy who was even, young, even younger than me. And this was only two blocks from my family home and just a few weeks um, following my graduation from Woodrow Wilson High School in San Francisco at the age of 17. But as common as the theme of police brutality and police killings have become for me as a writer, the role of poetic form and the language that I use in the poem, What Not To Do, are very atypical in my writing. It may be the least poetic of my poems in terms of language. It is a serial poem that I've been updating with the names of especially unarmed black boys and men executed by the police. The essay includes an ex exerted um, version. This is, that is the essay that will appear um, on the blog. Uh, but since I have enough time today, I'm gonna share a longer excerpt than what appears in the essay. So this is the poem, the serial poem, what not to do, an unfinished poem. Breathe, Eric Gardner choked. Sell, Lucy's. Resist to death. Stare, Lamont Hunt shot back of head. Make a Kai Gully a jarring sound shot accidentally. Stand, Amadou Diallo in vestibule. Carry wallet, loiter while walking, look out of place, act suspicious. 41 fire, 19 bullets kill. Walk, Terrence Crutcher, hands in air, appear intoxicated, have a very hollow look, shot in back. Drive, Samuel DeBose, without license plate, shot in head. Drive, Walter Scott, with broken tail light, shot in back. Move, Kendrick James, into driver's seat, after driver arrested, shot in head. Sit. Jordan Edwards, an armed, in car, shot with rifle. Reverse Deontay Yaber, too suddenly, 30 bullets fired, 10 kill. Park Tanya Haggerty on side of road. Talk on cell on side of road. Shot on side of road. Drive Philandro Castile with broken brake lights. Carry legal firearm. Announce you have a gun. Shout not reaching for gun. Shot five bullets, two to heart. Crawl Daniel Shaver toward officers as instructed. Pull loose gym shorts, too suddenly. Beg not to be shot, shot anyway. Approach Oscar Grant, the police. Beg not to shoot, kneel, shot anyway. In back, fail Sandra Bland to signal. Act to uppity, found hanging in cell. Carry Anthony Lamar Smith, planted weapon, shot five bullets. Carry Tamir Rice to a gun, shot with real bullets. Carry Cameron Tillman, BB gun, shot. Carry Remain Bisman, prescription bottle, shot two bullets to torso. Carry Laquan McDonald, knife and road, shot 16 bullets. Carry Miles Hall gardening tool. Have schizoaffected disorder shot. Carry Stephen DeMarco Taylor baseball bat at Walmart. Have a manic episode shot. Not carry Keith Lamont Scott a gun when told to drop it shot. Drop Kwan Ray a gun found later shot in back. B. Natasha McKinney, schizophrenic. B. 
superhuman, stunned while shackled 50,000 votes to death. B, Tanisha Anderson, bipolar, head slammed to pavement. B, Michelle Shirley, bipolar, while driving 30 bullets, eight to chest, back, arms. B, Sharice Francis, off meds, four police bodies suffocate. B, Aaron Campbell, suicidal. B, unarmed, shot. B, Yvette Smith, armed when not armed, shot on fort front porch. B, Michael Large. B, Michael Brown, too large. B, same height as shooter, shot six bullets, two to head. B, John Crawford, an imminent threat, shop for Walmart air rifle, carry Walmart air rifle at Walmart, talk on cell phone at Walmart, shot with real bullets at Walmart. B, Terrence Franklin, a suspect, shot five bullets to head. B, George Floyd, a suspect. B, a six foot seven black man. B, claustrophobic, asphyxiated, knee on neck while handcuffed. B, Tony McDade, trans, move, consistent with using a firearm, shot, pose as L. Ford, an imminent threat, shot while schizophrenic, display, Manuel Logan Jr.'s, a mean expression, shot in front of daughters, call, Kalina Lyles, police, while mentally ill, shot, seven bullets, fit, Jordan Baker, the description, shot, flee, Freddie Gray, unprovoked, spine severed in custody, run. Stephen Clark, the grandmother's yard, carry, cell phone shot, 20 bullets fired, eight hit, primarily in back. Run, Shinedu Akobi, unarmed in traffic, tased to death. Run, Walter Scott, shot in back. Jog, Ahmaud Arbery, shot, two bullets killed while hunted. Play Atiana Jefferson, call of duty in bedroom. Little Zion watching, shot. Sleep, Ayana Jones on couch, shot. One bullet to seven-year-old head. Sleep, Brianna Taylor in bed, shot. Eight bullets kill. Sleep, Rashad Brooks at Wendy's. Flee for daughter's birthday. Point, did taser over shoulder, shot. Two bullets in back. Walk, Elijah McCain home. Look, sketchy, play music, wave hands, wear ski mask, shop for iced tea, carry iced tea, resist contact, act crazy, explain, can't breathe, beg to go home, be superhuman, be anemic, be an introvert, be suspicious, be agitated, be tense, be on something, be medicated, be undetermined, choked to death, breathe. So the, the starkness, the cold autopsy-like cataloging, the, the focus on the victim's names, the exaggerated punctuation, the painfully plain language are purposeful. My intention is to honor the victims, to make the unaware aware and expose both the perpetrators and the mundaneness of the incidents precipitating the killings. Typically, poetic form is less important to me than the music, the rhythm, and the message of the poem. And what not to do, the form is critical and so necessary that I had to create a structure to maintain creative continuity in a poem that I would be re revising with morbid regularity as the killings continue. So I had to kind of discipline myself to resist turning each despicable incident into a separate poem because each one of these could be a poem in themselves. I had to restrain my journalistic instinct to add more detail and background while writing and editing the poem. Um, I was concerned less with whether or not it was poetic and more concerned with creatively conveying its content, its truth. While the questions of form and language are a major part of the essay that I've contributed to the University of Arizona um, Poetry Center blog, the other point that I attempt to drive home in the essay is that when I'm moving as a poet from observation, commentary, cataloging, and searching to a mode where I'm writing with the hope of transforming minds and conditions, I'm conscious of that shift. 
And when I write with the intention of transformation, I struggle with my belief that language is not enough. And based on the intent and the purpose of the poems that I started with, not even as Dan Joaquin and searching for Bob Kaufman, I find that language is enough for the purpose of those poems. For the intended purpose of what not to do an unfinished poem, I, I find the language is not enough. I feel the need to connect that poem and its language to social movements, to organizations, to distribution platforms, and to the public. And I, I feel the same way about belonging. I identify with the words of um, John A. Powell and Stefan um, Medidian in the problem, problem of othering toward inclusiveness and belonging. Quote, belongingness must be more than expressive. It must be institutionalized as well. To counteract othering, we must focus on providing access to resources and critical institutions to disadvantaged groups. Mm -hmm. In teaching to transgress, Bell Hooks responded brilliantly to Adrian Rich's line, this is the oppressor's language, yet I needed to talk to you. And Hooks writes, quote, reflecting on Adrian Rich's words, I know that it is not the English language that hurts me, but what the oppressors do with it, how they shape it to become a territory that limits and defines how they make it a weapon that can shame, humiliate, colonize, end of quote. So what will we do with it? Uh, there's much to do. I suggest we include the act of seizing belongingness with both the language of liberation and the instruments of social transformation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, I just wanna, um, I'm just, just still thinking about that poem and I'm thinking about all the things that you said and um, I'm looking forward to seeing that on the page and how, how that lays on the page, um, especially based on sort of what you talked about. Uh, so thank, thank you. you. Um, we're now on to our third reader, um, Louis Vet Resto. Louis Vet Resto is a mother, teacher, poet, and Wonder Woman fanatic. Um, she was born in Aguas Buenas, Puerto Rico, but proudly raised in the Bronx. Her two books of poetry, Unfinished Portrait and Ascension, have been published by Tia Chucha Press. Some of her latest work can be read in Anomaly, the Accentos Review, and in an anthology titled What Saves Us? Poems of Empathy and Outrage in the Age of Trump, edited by Martin Espada. She is the executive director of Angel's Flight Literary West Magazine. Her latest poetry collection, Promises Are Coffee, is forthcoming by Flower Song Press. She lives in the San Gabriel Valley with her three children, otherwise known her, as her revolutionaries. Thank you, Louis Yvette, for being here with us today. Thank you, Diana. Um, and thank you to uh, the University of Arizona. And it's just amazing to be here with Michael, Peter, and Luis, uh, who I've all read with before, but this is still an amazing honor to be in your presence. Um, and to actually call you friends is, and is pretty phenomenal for me. Um, so keeping this in mind regarding language, um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, these cultural academic grifters that are going around. Uh, I mean, they've been, they've been living among us for quite some time, but we've been hearing they're unearthing themselves more and more. And so there was one particular grifter whose name should now be made because I refuse to, to give any more attention to that person, but it really bothered me um, claiming to be from the Bronx. Right, and to being a, a, a Bronx Boricua even on top of that. And so I didn't realize how offended I was. And the more and more I kept reading about the grifter, um, I just took it to the page. And so uh, this is what I have come up with and it's called uh, BX All Day, Every Day. The Bronx isn't a resume builder. You don't get a Girl Scout badge because you lived there today or 20 years ago. You don't come from the Bronx. The Bronx, the Bronx comes from you. And you don't survive coming from the Bronx either. It isn't trying to kill you so you can justify leaving it behind. 
abandoning it like one of the buildings in the 80s with painted flower pots on the windows, more aesthetically pleasing for the Jersey commuters as they crawl on the Cross Bronx Expressway, which is always under construction. The Bronx is more than switching your T's for D's when you say water. The accent isn't part of your audition for the next Spike Lee movie. The Bronx is more than dancing to hip hop and bomba. It's Lisa Lisa in the cult jam and TKA in the community center basement at your cousin Sweet 16. It's having enough spray cans and D batteries for the boom box. The Bronx is in the side eye when someone says something suspicious. It is in the amount of yo's and dead asses used in the story because yo, I'm dead ass when I tell you that shit happened like I said it did, but in the end, we good. The Bronx is the original Yankee Stadium and hating on the Mets in perpetuity. The Bronx is witnessing love triangles at the park unravel like a telenovela. The Bronx is the ineptitude of the two train and cursing Robert Moses when you surface. The Bronx is knowing bodega aisles like treasure maps. It is getting ready for a night out and searching for my favorite hoop earrings and Borico red lipstick. The Bronx is willing to roll without hesitation when your comadre hits you up. The Bronx is sitting at a meeting and asking the questions no one is willing to ask because in the BX, there is no sugarcoating. So that was uh, my homage to the Bronx. I have many of those, but yes, that's for the, uh, for the grifters um, and I am a lover of language. Um, and so um, I teach grammar on a regular basis, which is not the sexiest thing to teach, by the way, if you ever have to teach grammar, uh, it's not. But so this is my, um, my take on prepositions. If uh, I spent like a lot of time teaching prepositions to, to students for the past like 20 years. Uh, so this is called, Intimate grammar rule, laugh plus a preposition. Laugh with me when it starts to rain on our beach day. Laugh without hesitation and order a second bottle of wine. Laugh despite wanting to shut down. Laugh versus arguing about last night's miscommunication. Laugh about the stupid thing that one guy said that one time we went to that place. Laugh to make me feel less alone. Laugh after I defy gravity and trip going up the stairs. Laugh alongside me walking on the outside of the street because that's what your grandfather taught you. Laugh through the hardest months. Laugh in spite of wanting to yell. Laugh for our survival. Laugh at me when I snort. Laugh at the moment I interpretive dance Barry White's greatest hits while making breakfast. Laugh as well as hold me. Laugh between the pregnant pauses. Laugh then cry. Laugh underneath the covers as we share bad dating stories. Laugh until we cannot laugh anymore. Laugh during sex because that shit is funny sometimes. Laugh except for when you want to kiss me. Laugh like when we first met. Laugh above anything else. Prepositions can be sexy. So there you are. Um, uh, I am a, a lover of words. Um, and going with this notion of language, um, speaking Spanish in Puerto Rico is very different than speaking Spanish in LA, by the way. I, I, um, I think Luis is like, yes, that's true. Um, certain things get lost in translation. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, when I first met my mother-in-law and I said the word pinche and that did not go well at the dinner table because I was asking for a barrette. I was like, where's my pinche? And everyone at the dinner table was like, what are you saying? So this is kind of going along with that. It's called Sonnet for Our Lexicon. The first morning we spoke the language of our ancestors, confusion spread between us like an epidemic. Your furrowed brow stripped my language naked as I asked you to leave the room, but you stood your ground. I repeated in my Boricua Spanish to come back later, but your Chicano ears 
understood right now. You questioned the validity of the word zapacón, laughed when I pointed to the beret in my hair and called it a pinche. I insisted an orange is a china, not a naranja. Jaguagua sounded much better than autobús. As we compiled a list of our lexicons, mi viejo San Juan began to play in the background. Your hand asked for a dance and my body said, Simón. Um, I, again, I love words. I have like a list of my top favorite words of all time. I just like the way they sound. Like facetious is one of my favorite words ever because it doesn't sound the way you spell it, but it's, and also just what it means. So anyway, I have a list of top 10 words. My students always make fun of me. Um, so uh, lover of words means logophile. And so um, this poem is called Logophile and this is for word lovers. You like the way my lips come together when I say the word serendipity. Something about the letter P coming together just to be pulled apart again to complete the word. What about post-meridian? Begins together, ends together. Doesn't count. It's two words you mumbled under the goose feather comforter. Corruption is better. The tongue has a bit of a solo before acquiescing. The morning sunshine intruded our conversation and barren apartment walls as candle wax trickled over wine bottlenecks. Um, and so I, again, just still kind of going along with this. Uh, not such a great experience, I would say, um, in graduate school being told uh, by a professor at the time who's no longer with us, but who was a Pulitzer Prize winning author who said there was no place for bilingualism in poetics. And I've said this, I've shared this story many times in this poem many times, but it really is an important poem because I was the only person in the space of 10 students who was writing in Spanish. So it was like a very passive aggressive way of saying, your poems are not valid and your language is invalid. And, and again, it was a really disheartening thing to hear. You know, I was like, you know, fresh out of college and first year, first semester of graduate school. So uh, definitely one of those moments that was not fun. So I got really ticked off and um, but one of my mentors, Martina Spada was teaching uh, right down the hall and I went to his office and I was really ticked off. I tell the story because I was just so upset. And I said, I can't believe this man said this. And, you know, Martin was like, put your earrings back on and write about it. Like you need to write about it. And so I did. And this is what I came up with. And it's a pretty straightforward poem with the title. A poem for the professors who say there's no place for bilingualism in poetry. That afternoon, as he took the last drag of his cigarette and moved on to the next topic, all of the Spanish words angrily rose from my stanzas, scratch their accents and tildes dubious at what they heard. They yelled for revolution, demanded protests and marches. They held nightly meetings on my desk, surrounded by a dictionary underneath a poster of Zapata and Che. The Enyes led discussions on military tactics and guerrilla warfare as the double R screamed, we should have stayed in Neruda's pages, at least there we were considered genius. Where did they belong? What was this thing called place? And why couldn't all words exist there? News spread of the old men who deny words of place as different languages held caucuses asking questions. Where do words with accents, tildes, and apostrophes go when they are shunned from the page and mouth? If English is not your first, but your second or third, why is it permitted to cut in line? The French letters wondered where Eliot fit in this monolinguistic theory. The Italians wondered about the cantos. All the words organized and packed their bags, traveled through deserts and mountains, founded their own place, where the old men are prohibited from issuing prohibitions. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'm going to close with this poem because it's one of my longer poems and I rarely read it, um, but it's really, uh, I think, appropriate. Um, growing up, uh, moving from Puerto Rico to, to the Bronx, uh, and I'll talk more about her probably later, but my grandmother, who's still alive to this day, she's 91, uh, was the one who really has always pushed education and literature. 
like she was the reader in the family. Um, and even to this day, like for Mother's Day la this uh, last year, I bought her the Michelle Obama biography in Spanish because, you know, um, that's what that's what I would do for her. I would buy her all these biographies in Spanish. So um, moving out here, uh, you know, being educated in the Catholic school system, one of the things my grandmother would say is, no pierdes tu idioma, right? Don't lose your language. And so it was interesting growing up hearing that always and almost as if language is something that you can lose like your glasses or your keys almost like it was this tangible thing that you're like oh where's my language oh aquí está right and it was just really fascinating to me so i took this idea and i kind of ran with it and so this is the narrative poem that came from that it's called a journey for the mute salvador woke up one morning in silence his lips opened, but only air resonated. His hand reached into his mouth and searched for his voice box. His voice box was alone, feeling the loss of its companion, language. Language left Salvador. Questions drove him drunk with no answers for sobriety. Salvador tried living without language. He communicated with noises, wrote sonnets for the lonely, had imaginary conversations with imaginary people. In his mute travels, he searched and searched, lifted boulders, dug through graveyards, hoping to find it sitting, waiting to be found. To Salvador, this hide-and-go-seek game had no end. His life remained still and gray as he continued on his journey. Passersby like Don Loco Santana would ask, when was the last time Salvador remembered seeing his language? Salvador's mind rewound to the last night his mother read him a bedtime story. She would translate Little Red Riding Hood. In her version, the hood was rojo, the wolf was a lobo, and the grandmother sounded a lot like Abuelita Consuela who died when Salvador was 12. Just before his body lost the struggle against sleep, he would feel his mother's mouth kissing his cheek as she asked God to bless her mijo. Salvador shrugged off Santana's question along with his memory. He curses God for truths and Santana for living up to his name, Loco. So he walked, reclaiming his mission. He drew pitiful signs asking anyone if they had seen his language. His reward, a lifetime of thank you letters. He received a few replies, one of them from Reverend Clemente. He told Salvador the last time he saw his language was at Luz Divina's funeral. Salvador delivered his mother's eulogy bestowing all of her fragrances, graces, and blessings on the congregation. She was all he had in this fatherless world. From her, he learned to cook his own rice and beans, iron the crispest shirts, and listen selectively. She was wise. She knew why chickens didn't fly, and no other mother on the block could match the softness of her hair. She was all for him. Salvador cried in English that day as Spanish tears drizzled his mother's casket. He thanked everyone for coming, including the janitor who collected the loose petals from the floor. Reverend Clemente reminded Salvador of the weekly, of the weekly Spanish mass, always on Sundays at 5 p.m. Guidos, tambourines, and guitars were welcome for those I need to be saved again moments. Salvador buried Reverend Clemente's letter in the freshest soil on the sunniest side of the earth with hopes that it would grow his mother back to life. Another letter came from his best friend Cristobal, he last saw Salvador's language running out of harm's way the day they were both stopped by the police at the mall who didn't believe that they could afford the brand name clothing they were wearing. The policeman said, even though one of their relatives made the clothing for five cents an hour, that gave them no right to wear such things. When he asked for names, Salvador became Sal and Torres became uh, Towers. Cristobal could not believe the perfection of Salvador's Anglo accent. They were let off with a stern warning as Cristobal whistled Officer Krupke all the way home. Cristobal closed his letter asking after Salvador's whereabouts. They have not seen each other since that day. Salvador felt, hope, felt hopeless as he looked at the piles of letters. One name stood out from the pile. It came from Miss Paloma, his kindergarten teacher. She was gorgeous and the first woman he ever loved aside from his mother. Miss Paloma was married, a hyphen after her name. She recalled the first time she saw Salvador's language. 
he entered her classroom with a note stapled to his brown polyester vest, listing all of his allergies to paste, crayons, toxic watercolors, finger paint, and some girls. She introduced herself with silence as his response. She tried it again, but this time with her island-grown Spanish. Salvador smiled with four missing teeth and a weak hola. That first day, Miss Paloma was the student. She learned that he was five, just arrived in the US with his mother from a tiny island off Puerto Rico called Vieques. There were too many explosions to hear the coquis at night. Salvador had forgotten about that first day, the vest, the, the list written in his mother's perfect handwriting. His eyes filled with images, playing street football with Cristobal, Sunday masses with tambourines and everyone asking weekly penance for weekly sins, and his abuelita Consuela's skin, so wrinkled, he swore he could peel it off. He fell to his knees asking for forgiveness and salvation. Tears soaked his face and the land beneath him. He prayed for the reincarnation of his language. He begged for its return, promised never to allow silence in exchange for acceptance or denial. He swore to his God and his mother's God. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis-Vet. I was so taken away by that. Uh, it, it's almost like a children's story, uh, but it also is relatable to adults. Um, I love that. Thank you so much. For our final reader, we have Luis Rodriguez. Um, Luis Rodriguez believes a writer can change the world. Through the power of words, this acclaimed poet, novelist, children's book author, and journalist saw his way out of poverty and despair. Successful as a Chicano poet, Rodriguez thought he had put the street and his own days as a gang member behind him until his young son joined a gang. Rodriguez fought for his child by telling his own story in the national bestseller, Always Running, La Vida Loca, Gang Days in LA. This vivid memoir explores gang life and cautions against the death and destruction that haunts its participants. A New York Times notable book, Always Running was named one of the nation's 100 most censored titles by the American Library Association. The book has been included on school reading lists nationwide, but has often been the subject of controversy due to, in, due to its frank depictions of gang life. Jonathan Kozell called Always Running an absolutely unique work, richly literary and poetic, yet urgent and politically explosive at the time, a permanent testament to human courage and transcendence. Writing in the New York Times book review, Gary Soto said Rodriguez's account of his coming of age is vivid, raw, fierce, and fearless. Here's truth no television set burning night and day could ever begin to offer. Always Running was adapted as full stage play in 2019 by Luis J. Rodriguez and Hector Rodriguez for Casa 101 Theater in Los Angeles. In 2012, Rodriguez also published It Calls You Back, an odyssey of love, addiction, revolutions, and healing. This sequel to Always Running was nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Uh, I will stop there, Louise. You have so many amazing things that you've done in your life to not only write, but also just to inspire others to write. So I just want to give you the warmest welcome um, to, for being here. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thought I'd start by reading a poem to my mother. And um, the story of my mother is that she was Tarumara, a native from Chihuahua, Mexico, who actually called themselves the Raramuri. But um, the thing is, we were living in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, and this is the basis for my new book of essays. And uh, when she had me born, she went across the border, the International Bridge to El Paso. Mm -hmm. And the thing that people don't recognize is that the Tarumara people had been in this area, in that desert, Chihuahua Desert, for at least 10,000 years. But there's a border there now, there's fences. There's a whole mess of things you have to do just to get to the other side. Mm -hmm. But we were going from our land to our land. And that's what people don't understand. Um, I feel very connected to my indigenous roots and to my mother in that sense. One of the terrible things about the, the Tarumara is that they're very healthy when they live in the Sierra Tarumara where they're from. They walk for miles, they eat the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans. They don't beat their kids, they don't beat their wives, they have just beautiful culture. But as soon as they get civilized, they go into the cities. 
And there's a ghetto in Chihuahua City where my mom was born called La Tarumara. They're alcoholics, they beat their wives and kids, they've got diabetes, heart disease, they get everything, they become civilized. So my mom, when we moved to Watts, where first community we moved to in LA was Watts, my mom was like in her 20s when she had me. She was very unhealthy, very obese. She had no teeth because they had all rotten away. She had diabetes and also thyroid problems. She was in bad shape. Uh, but one of the problems she had is in this poem, and I'll just share it with you. Um, and Watts is important for me because even though I lived so many places in LA, it was the first community outside of Mexico that I began to understand. And I heard, I, I got a lot of the racial issues, the racial discriminatory issues there going to school where they were literally beat you up if you spoke Spanish, where um, a teacher slapped me across the face in front of a classroom, you know, where um, they're just, a, the, you get the idea that this is not a good place to be, all black and brown kids. Anyway, this poem is called Heavy Blue Veins, Watts, 1959. Heavy blue veins streak across my mother's legs. Some of them bunched up into dark lumps at her ankles. Mama periodically bleeds them to relieve the pain. She carefully cuts the engorged veins with a razor and drains them into a porcelain-like metal pail called a tina. I'm small and all I remember are dreams of blood. Me drowning in a red sea, blood on sheets on the walls, splashing against the white pail and streams out of my mother's ankle. But they aren't dreams. It is mama bleeding into day, into night, bleeding a burst of memory, my mother, my blood, by the side of the bed, me on the covers, and her slicing into a black vein and filling the pail into some dark, forbidding red nightmare which never stops coming, never stops pouring this memory of mama and blood and Watts. So I wanted to start with that and to also uh, say that I'm reading here from the Tatavium Tongva lands of the San Fernando Valley section of Los Angeles, uh, again, to honor the indigenous um, and uh, uh, the next poem, I, uh, these are poems I've read a lot, but I wanted to share them here because there's some of my favorite poems uh, that I've written. It's very, this poem is kind of important because it's the first time I ever came across poetry. And I never got poetry in high school. I never got poetry in school. I know you, people said you never got, it. we were living in barrio schools. All the books were discards. We had no supplies. You know, kids were dropping out in middle school, at least where I was coming from in, East, in the East LA area. But anyway, what happened is I was, um, as some of you know from what was running, I was uh, a heroin uh, user, um, along with every kind of drug you could use. And um, I ended up writing as a teenager in jail in juvenile hall. And some of my writing got sent to a contest in Berkeley, the Quinto Sol Literary Contest. And I actually won honorable mention. I was 18 years old. They gave me $250, which in 1973, when I was 18, was a lot of money, especially good, clean money, <laughs> not drugs or nothing. And, um, and they actually paid my trip from LA to Berkeley. It was an amazing thing. I, I never could imagine anybody would care, um, but I was still on heroin and I was still hurting. But I went, I went on this trip. And at one point I was thinking, you know, they gave the wards and everything. And I was thinking, uh, I went to the hotel and I go, you know, I'm just going to go down the street and score because everywhere you can find anybody. So heroin, I'll find some somebody and I'll score and I'll be fine because I was starting to feel all the withdrawal stuff. Anyway, um, I was getting ready to leave the room and all of a sudden all the people from the contest came to the lobby and they saw me and said, oh, we want to invite you to a poetry reading. And I go, oh my God, I don't want to go to no poetry. I don't even know what poetry is. So what they, they talking about, oh no, come with us. It's a cafe, you'll love it. Oh man, uh, but I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't have the heart to say no. And I thought, well, I would just go and then I'll sneak out and I'll score anyway. But I never did that, that, that night anyway. I ended up finding poetry and it, kept, it was in the form of three great poets. One, Jose Montoya, the great the Chicano, Godfather of poetry for us. David Henderson, who was the leading African-American 
performance poet at the time, and the great Puerto Rican poet, Pedro Pietri. They were there on one stage together. Wow. So, I mean, this was like the most amazing thing. So this is the poem about how I got pulled into poetry by these, these great poets. It's called Fevered Shapes. I wallowed in a needle spawned world, addicted to dope and the crazy life. And yet there I was in Berkeley for my first poetry reading. I was 18 with a bullet, as they say. Earlier, I had flown on a plane for the first time. Sure, I've survived half a dozen gun assaults, cops knocking me around, ODs, blades to my neck and jail cells, homelessness and dank streets and beatdowns and body of bras. But flying, that scared me to death. I sat there in a crowded cafe not knowing what to expect. Poetry, I never heard this before. Oh, I had written lines, vignettes, images, fears, thoughts. I didn't know they were poems. I had no idea what a poem was. First up on the mic was Jose Montoya with Chicano prayers of old pachucos and strained loves and guitar solos and Indian hands in cornflower. Then David Henderson took the stage, gleaning urban black streets, racist stairs, Black Panther fury, and Southern cooking. Finally, Pedro Piazza came out, neo rican wordmeister, flashing at Radio's experiences with poems located in phone booths and real life wisdoms that made us laugh and shake our heads. I had never heard words spoken this way. More music than talk more fevered shapes than sentences, more Che and Malcolm than Shakespeare. These poems came for me, lassoed my throat, demanded my life savings, taking me for a, mid, for a sunset ride. These poems were graffiti scrawls along the alleys and trash-strewn tunnels of my body, the metaphoric methadone for the heroin hurting through my bloodstream, the lifeline I already had inside and didn't know. These poems were pool sticks, darkened gangways, a swirl of sunrise after the graveyard shift, a blood black yelling behind torn curtains, a child shrieking and nobody coming to help. These poems were shadowed in tents, startled doubts, sorrows without grief, the moon without sky, unknown melodies, the falling inside that happens when you push razor onto wrist. They came for me as I sank into my suicide while fidgeting in a chair, inching under the skin as I wonder why I even came. Jose, David, and Pedro. I was never the same after this. They came for me and I've never let go. They came for me and I've perspired poems ever since. They came for me and all my Dixons, my sorry ass lies, my falling masks, my pissed off wives, neglected children, angry friends, and back to back failures could never ever take them away. So, um, <laughs> I wanted to, first of all, thank, thank you all and thank the poetry center there at the University of Arizona. And then it turns out that these are all my friends here. And I really appreciate that. Each one of you mean a lot to me. And people will say, like with Louis Ved and Michael and, and um, uh, Peter, that I publish my friends. Well, here, here's the truth. I don't, most of the Atucha Press published people I don't know. But it just so happens that I have great poet friends. And Deanna, you're one too. You're yep. a good friend. Um, I remember the walks we did and talks we did in San Antonio when we were in Macondo. So, and you're an amazing poet. So it just so happens that I happen to have friends who are great poets. And uh, just to be clear, I've had a lot of friends send me manuscripts who I don't publish because they're just, for me, not where they should be. That's just the way it goes. Um, but I do feel like um, the friends who are great poets include um, Louis Vett and Michael and Peter, who are amazing poets or poetry just all of them different powerful moving deep and um encompassing so i just wanted to mention that to everybody in case people have any other ideas about this stuff um i wanted to share though um two new poems and 
Well, at least one new poem, because I don't think I want to share the other one. But the, the one new poem is one of the things that I miss because of the pandemic, because I've been teaching poetry in prisons and juvenile halls and jails for 40 years in one form or the other. Usually I do one time poetry readings or talks or healing circles, but I've also been doing these several weeks, several months, and even years of creative writing classes. And since 2007, I was been teaching at Lancaster State Prison in California, which is a high level prison, um, high security level prison. So, um, and because of the pandemic, we don't get a chance to go back. They don't allow any more instructors and they don't really allow us to get in touch with anybody. And so I'm hearing from people that people are getting sick. The COVID has killed close to 60 people in, um, in the state of California and hundreds and hundreds have been sick. And, and a lot of families that we know don't know what's going on. They don't communicate. There's a lot of problems going on here. And so I really miss these guys and, uh, and women because I also went to the, the women's prison as well. Um, so I wrote a poem for them as well. And just so you know, just so people understand, I, I also published um, a new book. And I don't mind sharing it. You can get this at my bookstore, theachucha.org slash bookstore, along with all my books and other Theachucha Press books. All the books from these poets are over there. But uh, Make a Poem Cry just came out and it's in uh, creative writing from California's Lancaster prison. These are guys in my classes that we published. We wanted to honor their voices and came out during the pandemic. And it's edited by myself and Kenneth E. Hartman who did 38 years in the California prison system. So I'm gonna read the poem that I wrote based on this title and it's called Make a Poem Cry. And it starts with a, um, a, a state of, uh, excerpt of a poem by one of the poets, Jimmy McMillan, who's still incarcerated in the prison system in California. And it starts with this one line, I can't see him coming from my eye. So I had to make this poem cry. You can chain the body, the face, the eyes, the way hands move coarsely over cement or deftly on tattooed skin with needle. You can cage the withered membrane, the withered dreams, the way razor wire shouts, yells, and batons can wither spirit. But how can you imprison a poem? How can a melody be locked up, locked down? Yes, even caged birds sing, even grass sprouts through asphalt, even a flower blooms in a desert. In the gardens of trauma we call the incarcerated, can also spring with the vitality of a deep thought and emotion buried beneath the facades, deep as rage, deep as grief, the grief beneath all rages. The blood of such poems, songs, emotions, thoughts, dances are what flow in all art, stages, films, books. The keys to liberation are in the heart, in the mind, behind the cranial sky. The imagination is boundless, the inexhaustible in any imprisoned system. And remember, we are all in some kind of prison. If only the contrived freedom society professes can flow from such water. So, um, and it means a lot to you, to me, as many of you know, because of my own um, relationship to jails and and all that, but also my son who did 15 years in prisons. And my son, Ramiro, who I wrote the book, obviously running, and, and you mentioned him. Uh, the thing about him, just so people know, he's doing really well now. He's been out of prison for 10 years. He did all those years, but he um, took him a long time. It's very hard to vet knows him very well. It's been hard for him to be in the world. The reentry issues, the reintegration is very difficult, but he's been working at it. And now he does danza, he does Mexica danza. And he also writes poetry. He himself is a poet. And he's also helping mentor uh, people. We started a program at Thea Tuchas Center Cultural called From Trauma to Transformation, working with the formerly incarcerated and people and institutions. And now he's been helping with that. Uh, working with one guy who did 28 years in, in prison uh, and uh, another guy who did 10 years and there's been other people that we were working with. So my son is doing really good. I want to mention that just, just because his name came up. 
I want to end with this poem to Los Angeles because it is again Los Angeles to me. You know, I've I've lived in the Bay Area, I've lived in Chicago 15 years, and the Indian Empire, which people don't know, Diana knows. The Indian empires were uh, L.A. County, San Bernardino County, and Riverside County meet it's that area that meets there, and I lived there for a couple of years. But L.A. is really my home. It's even though. I left it for a long time. I uh, I consider it where I am from, and it's my, my where imagination really grows and develops, and where I feel there's any belonging. It's it's LA, and LA is a really hard place to belong to, as anybody knows LA, but it, I do. And um, so this is my poem to LA, and uh, one of my poems that I wrote when I was poet laureate of the city. I was very honored to do that uh, 2014 and 2016, and it goes like this. This is Los Angeles, where Santa Ana winds scatter dry leaves and droughts make tinder out of the formerly green brush, where wildfires are metaphor and reality for our internal and external terrains, where the city is music but also muscles, a rain dance often with no rain, neon glared smog tint skyline held together in a spider web of freeways. It's a place where even jacarandas and palm trees are transplants. This is where the city's buildings are bricked and nailed together with survival stories, war stories, and love stories. The kind of harrowing accounts Los Angeles unfur unfurls at 3 a.m. when ghosts meander along the upturned pavement or rumble by on vintage cars and all-night diners convert into summits for the played out, heartsick and suicidal. There's a migrant soul in this rooted city, skid road next to the diamond district, waves of foam against barnacled piers, cafes and boutiques next to botanicas. Ravines and gullies turn into varios, rustic homes with gardens dot bleak cityscapes and suburbs burst with world-class graffiti. Fragmented yet cohesive, Los Angeles demands reflection on ourselves and the unstable ground we call home, where people die for a lack of a roof or food or compassion. As renowned LA writer John Fonte would say, these persons are songs over sidewalks, imaginations on the interchange, humanity that deserves connection, touch, breath. These roads, bridges, and alleys also contain concertos, Breezes over the ocean's darkest depths are replete with harmonies and a howling moon and red sunset serve as backdrops for every aching interlude. Los Angeles is where every step rhymes, where languages flit off tongues like bowls across strings. Skateboarders and aerosol spray cans clatter in a daily percussion and even angels intoned, we can do better, we can do better while haggling at garage sales. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louise. And I really appreciated you giving context to all of the other things that you've been doing aside from you know, your most recent book, uh, the Chuchas Cultural Center, uh, you, the books uh, that uh, can be found uh, online. You also have a bookstore and you're also doing a lot of transformative work, not only about um, you know, the prison reform, but also just about trauma, trauma that is sort of in underrepresented communities everywhere. So I just, I honor the work that you do. We've been friends for a long time. Um, and it's just, you're such an inspiration. Um, and then you have such good friends here too, who are amazing poets. So I'm so glad that you were able to invite them. Luis, um, this is a question about, you know, I mentioned a little bit about all the work that um, the Chuchas Cultural Center is doing, and one of them is the press. Um, and, you know, I was having a conversation with Rigoberto Gonzalez recently, and he talked about how the Chuchas Press early on um, published some of the first books and sometimes the second books of Terrence Hayes, Elizabeth Alexander, Avan Jordan, and Patricia Smith, all amazing um, poets. Um, and you also have given a talk previously related to this question um, at the Art for Justice Conference in New Orleans 
about the intersection between uh, black and brown communities. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that topic um, and what drew you to the work because oftentimes we become classified, right? Like the brown community can only support the brown community and the black community can, mm -hmm. and, and it's created a lot of division. And I just wanted to know if you could speak a little bit about that topic, because it's been on all of our minds. Yeah, because people think what's well, Thea Chucha Press and Luis Rodriguez is the founding editor. It's going to be all about Chicanos or maybe at least Latinx, you know what I mean? I, my criteria, Michael knows this because he was there in the beginning, was the best poets that I could find. You know what I'm saying? It didn't really, I didn't look at race or ethnicity. I just wanted the best poets. And, but I also wanted those poets that other people probably were not going to publish, at least at the time. And so we, both me and Michael were part of the slam poetry scene that came out of Chicago. We were both very active in it. Um, the Gill Complex, which Michael was the, the founding director and I helped um, uh, in the first meetings that we had created was really enmeshed with that. So what I was looking for was the first, the slam poets that were also not just good on the stage, but on the page. I was looking for that. That's how Patricia Smith got published in. Um, uh, a lot of great people, uh, Lisa Bascani and Tony Fitzpatrick, um, a number of great poets that came out of there, David H uh, Hernandez, a lot of great poets that came out of that scene. And then pretty soon it became people who knew me were sending me manuscripts from all over the country and including friends of mine that ran, you know, they were in pro uh, writing programs. That's how I met Louis Vett because Martina Spada, my good friend, sent he, her work. And I said, I want this. I, this is, so the people then sent me things. And that's how we became the Chucha Press. And again, I wasn't, the criteria wasn't what race or what ethnicity or whether you were queer or not. That We wanted to hear from everybody. And we did. We published so many great voices. I love all my books. Uh, I have to say that some have risen up faster and, and, and sold more than others. I wish all of them sold as well. But uh, but now we have an editorial committee. It's not just me making these decisions. Now we do work with other people who help us bring in more voices and everything. So I'm, I'm, that's the way it's worked. You just wanted to do the best and some of them have done well. Another thing about the nexus of black and brown was um, uh, one of the black, I think Black Scholar Magazine called the Achucha Press one of the best African-American presses, uh, only because of the fact that we, these African-American poets you talked about have risen up. Terrence, you know, uh, Patricia, of course, and Elizabeth, they've all risen up and, and done very well. So people thought that we were an African-American press. But again, I don't mind any of that. Well, for me, I've always lived in black and brown communities. To me, black and brown is the urban world. I think the white media world doesn't understand this, so they're always separating black from brown. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, hip hop is black and brown. Yeah. I mean, Louis Vett knows this because I actually went to the Bronx in 1981 when it was happening everywhere, when it was all over the place. I don't know if you were even born there, Louis Vett, I think you were, but anyway, the point was it was all over the place. I was, I went there and it was all black and brown. It was, um, uh, African-American, but also West Indies, um, Black, and also Puerto Rican. In other words, that was the heart of it. And the same thing with low writing culture, you know, the same thing with urban, almost all urban culture in the United States is Black and Brown. Mm -hmm. But what I find is that the, the media, the media tends to separate it, mm -hmm. tends to say, this is Black culture and here's Brown culture. And it's like, wait a minute, I grew up in these Vario ghettos all my life, that's all I know. And even Bacoima, where we're at now, is a body of ghetto. Housing projects, scans, is black and brown. Um, anyway, that that I think that's the point. In Chicago, where we were at, me and Michael, we lived in black and brown communities. That's what it was. So that's that's the only thing I could say. People got to think about urban culture. They shouldn't they shouldn't leave out the brown part. You know, I totally honor the black. It wouldn't be urban culture for whatever black culture, black music black rhythms and black voices, but uh, you can't leave the brown part out. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I now have a question um, for everyone. I'm going to just unmute you all. Um, um, I now have a question for everybody in the group. Um, and you can go ahead and unmute yourself for some reason that did not do it. Um, so it's kind of a large question, but like, 
much of world history that um, we're taught um, or that we see is about who, who belongs and who doesn't, um, who decides and how. Um, can poetry be an art that teaches us how we belong to each other, to community, to places, and to our own histories? Um, like, what, what does that mean? Well, I think I'm oh. going to, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in. No, go ahead, Louis. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, just because, just based upon even this reading, right, there was uh, a sense of belonging and commonality in many of our poems. And we didn't plan it. It's not like we got together before this whole meeting and say, hey, I'm going to read this. What are you going to read? And, you know, it was, it was not, a, it, it wasn't an act or anything. And so it wasn't premeditated, but it was just from even going from the top, Peter, and, and listening to his poems, which I've heard many times before and but but revisiting them again and him speaking about the erotic and I was just and in my head I was like I already have poems like that going on right now and that's that I was already planning that and then listening to Michael's poems um and especially the last one he read right it's like and then in listening to Luis's we all belong to each other our if anything our poems really really like to me at least connect me with everyone in this room. And anytime I'm in a poetry space, I, I tend to walk away with con connectivity and, and a positionality of like, we are all coming from, granted we could be different, uh, coming from different generations and, and geographic locations, but there is a connectivity that poetry provides. And um, especially from, uh, from black and brown communities, um, you know, we, we um, you know, for, for good or for bad, you know, we do unfortunately sometimes have traumatic experiences that kind of, you know, um, that kind of interweave our, our stories together in this beautiful way. So I, I definitely agree with that statement that that poetry can definitely mm -hmm. create a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, poetry or any other art form in and of itself it doesn't do anything in my opinion, but it can. I think the, the consciousness behind it or the cultural uh, imperatives behind it is, are, are what govern the outcomes of uh, the sense of belonging. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I've been for a long time a volunteer. I'm sort of like an OG among the OGs at the world stage in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. uh, but even there, I you know, always remember that in the community, there's a, a vitality that that is it's not um, belonging doesn't it's, I guess I'm saying that but belonging is not one note, so to speak. It's it, it is a, a true belonging allows for individuality within the community. And I remember some of the moments when we, uh, that was, uh, let's see, I, got, I think I got started at the stage in 89, no, sorry, 90, 91, 92. Um, and I remember just listening to all the different work. Uh, and I had just come from the East Coast, uh, Washington, DC, my hometown at the time. And I remember just realizing the, the variety of voices, uh, all of it vital, but the distinctions of the voice. Uh, and I think that's what's important to me, particularly uh, at this age in my life, this season in my life, is I'm really listening for um, the, the, uh, the sort of virtuosity that touches me, reminds me uh, that we are all in a family or a community or we're all human beings fundamentally. Um, so I am always, interested in community and belonging, but I, I think it has to be an inspirational enrollment, so to speak, so that people aren't in and of themselves, um, um, you know, made into generic beings. Yeah. Uh, because if you're made generic or if your work is generic for that matter, frankly, uh, you, you know, I, I, frankly, I don't wanna be in a, I don't wanna belong in a generic community. I want to belong in a community that's vital and where people are bringing their, uh, you know, whole selves so that we can really, really engage with each other and learn from each other and teach each other. 
Um, so for me, that's what poetry at its best can do. Thank you for that. I think that's a really interesting point. And this is the part of the comfort, the, the panel that I love is that, you know, we can like take the same question and people have different points. And to your point, Peter, the one of the things is, is about community, right? Like it, it can both be uplifting, but it can also bind, right? And in, 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 in worst cases, right? Keep people bound to this idea of like what it means to be part of that community. That's a really amazing point. Um, yeah, I, I think that the, the thing about your question is that it's, um, it's rooted in social relationships, right? It's how we belong to each other, to community and our histories. And so the, the impact of arts really does depend on social, the social relationships once it's created. So I, as an individual artist, I agonize over the words. You know, I spend most of my creative time uh, reworking what I've written and as difficult as that creative process is, it's far more difficult distributing the art that emerges out of it. You know, the, um, the planning, the cultivating, the harvesting, the sharing of what's being created. And so for our art to reach beyond our individual selves, right? Um, beyond our own nourishment, um, it has to be experienced by, by others. I, I just totally agree with everything that's been said um, so far. And so to me, that interaction of art in society creates the potential for change. Not, not all art has to do that. Not all art, mm -hmm. art has to engage in societal change. The personal transformation is just as critical as a social transformation. And I, in fact, I don't think there can be social transformation unless there's personal transformation. I mean, we can really see that in our country today. There's a lot of personal transformation that is going to be needed for this level of social transformation that we need. And as an artist, I choose to pursue both the personal and the social. But I don't dictate that any other artist has to approach it that way, um, sure. you know, so. No, I think that's, re yeah, that's a really good sort of marker and sort of distinction between starts with the self and then you kind of move outward uh, for certain individuals. Um, hey, uh, may, I, may I add? I I, yeah, I'd like Peter. to say, I, I consider this stuff what I call, or what our my core community would call grown folks work. So <laughs> I, I really think it's important. Uh, I mean, listen, you know, we clearly have communion. Uh, I'm just meeting Michael. I, I know some of your work with the complex, but you know, when you mentioned Ms. Brooks and stuff, I, you know, I, Ms. Brooks, you know, used to come to Baltimore and DC when I was there, when I was a young poet and she was so generous. Um, yes, Word. So, but this notion of, of, of just grown, ethical, serious, you know, courageous uh, communion and participation, that's what guides me uh, when I think about poetry and belonging community. I mean, you know, when you read Louis Vett's uh, bio, you know, she's now the editor slash, what is it, the executive director or something, uh, Louis Vett, the, uh, the publication that you invited me to participate in. I mean, as soon as she got leadership, and I've watched her do work at Avenue uh, 50 Studio in LA, she said, come on in, because that was her politics. You know, she didn't say, come on in because I like you or come on in. So I, I, I just think that this is about being grown ass people. Yeah. And that includes on a technical level, which is what we used to emphasize during the workshop at the stage, take the work seriously, not yourself, so that you are always honoring the best of a tradition. And, then, you know, if you look at that circle concept, when you get in the circle and you're the soloist, you only stay in there long as you can bring it. Right. And then when you exhaust your creativity or your virtuosity, you honor the belonging by getting your ass back in the circle and be ready to support somebody else while they're doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that additional, yeah, that's for sure. Um, some of you have answered this already and talking a little bit about your poems, but uh, this is for the group. Um, 
Can you share like a little bit about your own relationship to the idea of, of creating belonging through the language, right? Like we're talking, like, what is that? Does that resonate? Does that not resonate? Uh, creating belonging through language. Let me, let me just say, um, when you don't feel like you belong, you have to build a greater ground because that narrow ground, you're not going to belong. I never belonged in America. I don't care if I was born here, it doesn't matter. I never belonged. I never belonged in certain neighborhoods. Um, I couldn't walk in certain neighborhoods, you know, I couldn't be. And so, and then even when I lived in my poor ass neighborhood in Las Lomas in South San Gabriel, which Diana knows about, you know, I didn't feel that we belonged because we didn't own anything. <laughs> it was, we were, it wasn't our land. It was just, so you have to build a greater ground. To me, poetry and art, creation, it gives you a bigger ground where you feel like, hey, I can belong anywhere. I don't have to fall into the boundaries and the borders that other people have created. And so therefore you can feel like you can speak to anybody, go to any community. I remember, again, speaking of the black and brown, Amiri Baraka invited me to be, and I heard at the time that I was the only non-black person to read at the black um, London poetry festival mm. with, um, you know, West African Jamaican poets and with Amiri that he invited me to be there. I read, nobody made a big deal about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, it was like, fine. And I don't know if, they, if anybody else was invited that wasn't so-called black, but I will read it any, I wasn't reading in Japan. I don't know Japanese, but it doesn't matter. I'm there reading. In other words, world, the world opens up to you. Mm. The ground is bigger and we have to create that ground. It isn't just going to come. You have to work at it. But that's what I think makes it possible for me to belong anywhere, anytime. Mm. Yeah, one thing I've come to understand about this question of belonging, that if you think of any movement today to improve the condition, our condition in this country, they're all about belonging. You know, people trying to be acknowledged and, 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 and to, to belong. Um, two, two of my projects that are really about, and I've spoke to this earlier, you know, speaking of um, people, but particularly black people being able to belong without fear of being executed, you know, by the police for driving, for sitting, for talking, for walking, for running, for sleeping, for just existing. You know, in the anthology of poetry and protest, which that I edited, one of the things I talk about in there is about um, how the book can serve as a, as, a, as a tool in a toolbox of many tools. And so one of the things that I realized once the book was published by Norton um, is that something I wish I had done that I didn't do was to actually include a tool book <laughs> in the book. I mean, not one that you carry around with you, but a graphic tool book, toolkit, you know, that, um, that could direct readers to like a digital extension of the book where artists and activists could upload their content on the theme of unjust police killings, you know, where users could digitally access um, action steps for mass engagement, for connecting individuals to organizations, for connecting organizations to other organizations, to serving as a portal um, that includes collective, legal, legislative, and creative ways of um, ending those killings, of fighting against those those killings. So I'm trying to create that digital extension now. But when I think about um, belonging, I try to think of tools that we can use to struggle for, for what gets called belongingness, right? And mm -hmm. as far as my own work is concerned, that's one of the goals I, I have. And, you know, just on the poem, What Not to Do, I have a similar thing where I want to take that to the next stage as well that these are, are, are works that are unfinished in a way, when they get to the point that I feel they need to be out in the world, I put them out in the world, but I have the intention of doing something else with them. So with that poem, for instance, one of the ways it's already changed is it's going out to editors who are being told that this poem has already been published elsewhere, but because mm -hmm. it's a serial poem and it's being revised, editors are actually accepting 
publishing it, even though it's been published elsewhere. So that's yeah. not typically the way it happens. And lastly, that I want to do a digital version of that poem. I want a site where the updates that I'm constantly making to it are actually online. And that the, um, the poem is not only being changed, but that is being incorporated with images and, and art, you know, on the issue of police killings. Um, so for, for, for me, this is a way of, um, of having actual tools to struggle for belonging. Thank you. Um, I have, um, I've been thinking a lot about the acquisition of language um, and different languages, right? Uh, sometimes we pick up different languages when we're kids. Um, if, if each of you can just share a little bit about uh, like who taught you to read, if you can, you know, like <laughs> what is your memory of that? Um, Uh, for me, um, I mentioned her earlier in when I was reading, it was my abuela, yeah. um, who, again, I own a shout her out. She's 91 and voted and, uh, you know, was all about her selfie with her sticker and her pen. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, Maria Virginia Garcia Lozada, uh, who, again, just remains to be one of my inspirations to this day. Um, it was her tenacity and her initiative to to matriculate me when I got to the States, even though my mother wasn't here yet, she was still on the island. She was like, no, we're gonna do this. And and again, my grandmother was the one that convinced my principal at the time to accept me in kindergarten, even though I didn't speak English. Mm. Um, uh, Sister Catherine did not want to accept me because I didn't speak the language. But it was my grandmother in her limited English um, politics for me and said, she's smart, you know, and I was only four too. And on top of that, I was only four. So I wasn't five like everybody else. So, you know, Maria, you know, said, no, 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 she's smart. You know, she knows her colors, she knows her numbers. Uh, she knows her alphabet, it's just in a different language, but she knows all of this, give her a shot. And so my grandma, you know, she, she won that argument with Sister Catherine. And, you know, here I was in the middle of kindergarten with a bunch of kids that didn't speak the language, but, you know, she paid for my tuition at the time, which was $75 a month. Um, and I'll never forget that. And so she was the one that really, in my memory bank, was the one that pushed me to read in English and in Spanish. Like I said, when I started to kind of forget my, my Spanish, she would buy me, uh, you know, children's books in Spanish. And when we would go to Puerto Rico every summer, we did this, we did this summer trip from, you know, we would be there for two or three months. And so, you know, my grandmother, Abuela, was definitely, has been, when I think about reading and writing and being a writer, I think of this woman who, you know, didn't go to college, but went to secretary school, because that's what they called it at the time. And, you know, was the most educated of her, for siblings, right? Um, but yeah, I think of her fondly and um, I'm extremely grateful for her. Beautiful. Yeah, and my mother taught me how to read, I think um, her name was June Harris. She was a secretary too. Um, um, but you know, my first Spanish teacher was an African-American woman named Miss Evans in the third grade in DC. Uh, the problem was in DC was so stratified you know, just basically black folks. And then the few folks who spoke Spanish were more diplomats. And I never saw those folks, uh, you know what I mean, if you lived in that world. But, but I think that it's interesting as I've studied like brain research and whatnot. I mean, and of course our country is so one note, you know, we're the only country where folk literally think it's like their geniuses because they only speak one language, how ridiculous. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and they're all colonial languages anyway. But, but I, I do think that um, the thing for me, and this is why uh, I'm happy, and I, Louis Vett, I, I think I knew that Edward was also publishing some work that you're, you have coming up. But I've, this book that Edward at uh, Flower Song Press is gonna publish, I always wanted it in Spanish and in English, English and in Spanish. And um, I modeled it after the Neruda book, uh, 20 Love Poems and a Song of uh, Despair. And I, I, I tried and tried and tried. And finally, uh, uh, Francisco and I, who I've known now for over 10 years, but I forgot, you know, Francisco's from Chile. 
and is a very conscious and conscientious uh, poet and artist himself. And so we had a, just a marvelous time, you know, on the phone as he read back to me. And then he was uh, really, really uh, doing fine tuning. Uh, you know, he said, well, in, in, you know, in Chile, in Chile, we say it, we say this word, sort of what you were saying earlier, Louis Vett. But, you know, if, if you come through the, the prism of a sort of Mexican Spanish or Mexican American or Chicano Spanish, it's this. So I kept pushing saying, well, look, bro, you go with what's Chilean because that was the original uh, reason for trying to do these love and erotic poems and whatnot. Um, so I, I just, I, I've learned one more thing I love to say is one thing that I've loved about living in Los Angeles and getting to know uh, people like Gloria Alvarez and, and uh, you know, Mrs. Sparza and the Sparza family. And, and of course, Luis and I have known each other since 1980 is how you, if you're not gonna really do the work, as I said earlier, then shut up and listen. And so I'll go to a reading where I know most of the poets are gonna speak in Spanish and I just turn myself off, turn my ego off and I don't, I don't necessarily know everything that they're saying, but I embrace the sound and I embrace the, po the uh, power of the voice. And, you know, even back, uh, Luis, I don't know if you remember this, even back when I had this radio show on KPFK many years ago, I would always brief the upcoming guests by saying, among other things, and you are free to read in whatever languages you want to read in while you hear it. So if you hear some music that I'm playing and all of a sudden you want to move in and out of English and Spanish or Armenian or, or whatever, or you just want to go cold sounds, I don't care. Just do the work that you feel honors the poem or honors the thing that inspired you to begin the poem. So let me just add to that because I was on his show. And but one of the things I notice about language is that you may not even have to understand mm -hmm. the words to get the rhythm, to get the poetry. Mm -hmm. I've heard Russian poets read. I'm mm -hmm. there. I'm even falling in tears. I don't know why. It's mm -hmm. just the way they move. Or Japanese poets. I don't know Japanese, but I've got them in stage and they're reading and I'm there. So I think language has also got an other ultra dimensional aspect mm. to it mm. that's important for people to get. Plus, you know, Spanish and English are colonial languages to me. Not that I don't love them. I speak Spanish yeah. and English and I want to dominate those languages, but it's obviously <laughs> got this history and um, I'm learning indigenous languages. I'm learning Nahuatl. I know some Nahuatl words now. I went when I was with the Tarumara, I learned some of their words and the greeting they give, which is wirawa. I say it all the time. It means we are one. That's what they mm. greet each other with. We are one. Mm. Somos uno. Wirawa. So I think that it's good to think of language and more languages and learn uh, the power of language even beyond the actual understanding of the words. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, what Luis says uh, about the, the using those languages makes me think back to that quote that I used from um, Adrian Rich that, you know, this is their precious languages, yet I needed to talk to, 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 to you. Um, I just want to say about my own work, this question <laughs> was kind of um, very difficult for me because, first of all, I have an awful um, memory or at best a very a highly selective memory. So <laughs> I don't even recall um, a single children's book from my um, childhood. I have photographs of myself in kindergarten in the first grade in Baby Hunters Point in San Francisco, but I have no memory of what happened in that classroom. And I must have learned the alphabet there. Um, my earliest book related memory is pasting blank paper over the pages of Reader Digest articles to create my own book. So I had the, I had the, I had yeah. the desire for a book early in life, right? <laughs> um, and after reading, I can say with certainty that the tag team teachers were the Bible and comic books. And there, there weren't very many books in um, our home, but my mother did make it a point to buy a set of encyclopedias. And I spent a lot of time in those encyclopedias. And, uh, you know, concerning the, um, the acquisition 
of language. For me, it's the acquisition of language beyond pedestrian language or the language we need to function every day. Um, I do think that the Bible was the first kind of text um, to have kind of an inescapable influence on my sense of lyricism and, and, mm -hmm. and words. And, you know, the passages in the Song of Solomon, um, you know, I, I, I just share a few words from that. You are paradise that produces um, pomegranates, and, pomegranates and the best fruits, henna, flowers, and nard, nard and saffron, calamus, cinnamon, and all kinds of incense, mirror, uh, uh, aloe, and all the best spices. You are a spring for gardens, a well of living water flowing from Lebanon. I mean, you know, it's just sitting in, sitting in the congregation of the Jehovah's Witnesses, as Luis knows, that's how I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, and just reading all the time. Um, but I think that that lyricism, it had to have an impact on, on me, the kind of poetry in the, in, in the Bible. Um, but it wasn't until about 13 years old when reading and writing and music kind of took over my life and the last poets were my heroes and the Black Panthers were distributing um, outside my high school. Those things I can remember, but boy, for the life of me, I have no idea how I learned to read. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think you have a good idea of what happened after. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> I do. You, you were like, I don't need Reader's Digest. I need my own book. <laughs> um, so I'm super impressed. Um, Luis, do you remember as, as a final question, like, do you remember um, who taught you to read? Well, I will have to say I taught myself. I hate to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I did not speak English going into the schools. And as I mentioned, you were punished for speaking it. Yeah. I didn't learn English very well because they weren't teaching it in the schools very well. And I remember the only thing that helped me is that I love to read books. When I first got into books, I would just be reading it. And so I, the story that I told uh, Mayor Eric Gassetti when he gave me this poet laureate thing, he didn't know the story. He gave it to me at the Central Public Library with a lot of media and other people in my family was there, is that when I was 15 years old and I was in the streets, I was homeless, I was on drugs, I had a 22 handgun to mug people, to get money, I was sleeping wherever I could, I would go to that library, that was my refuge. And I read book after book, I read Ray Bradbury like crazy, I loved the Martian Chronicles, I read Charles Webb like 20 times, and I picked up Malcolm X, I picked up uh, James Baldwin, I picked up Perry Thomas, I picked up all these amazing African-American and Puerto Rican books that, because there was no Chicano books. Yeah. They spoke about my experience, even though they were in Harlem or they were somewhere else. Mm. They spoke about my experience. And I, and I thought, if they can do that, couldn't I do that? What an idea. What a, who would think of that? But that's what I started thinking. Maybe I could do it. And if you walk down those shelves now, you can see my books, Luis Rodriguez, all my novels and short stories and children's book there you can go there now and see them there so that's how that worked for me wow well we're going to be finishing up but it's been beautiful spending time with all of you hearing your work hearing your thoughts behind your work um and just appreciative for you taking the time and being with the, the poetry center to talk more about um our institute about uh, poetics inquiry and thought, um, and I just want to give a final thank you to everyone for just being very present um, and, and for your work. So gracias.